Joseph, can you hear me? Joseph, I think your microphone is muted. Yes, um, good evening to those of you who are in uh, East Africa, in Uganda, in Kenya, or around. And good afternoon to some of you who are in New England. And I think, Tom, your end, it must be morning, is it? It is indeed. <laughs> it's 9.09. It <laughs> <laughs> so good, good morning. Um, well, I am definitely looking forward to today's uh, conversation or this month lamppost conversation. Now, for some of you who are tuning in for the first time, lampposts are monthly Zoom conversations about the Bible, about life, about faith, where we host a scholar, a teacher, a professor to speak to us about various topics and various issues that are quite pertinent and relevant to our Ugandan context. And uh, today we will be privileged to host Dr. Tom Fizemaya and uh, just full disclosure, no, he's not behind the Pfizer medicine. There is someone who was asking me, Tom, <laughs> whether <laughs> you are related to the founders of, <laughs> of Pfizer uh, vaccine, but I can tell that you are not. Um, Dr. Tom is uh, a friend of mine, my former professor and lecturer for spiritual formation, um, and we will get to know much more about him but he is one of those people who took keen interest in me and Daphne when we had just joined Gordon Conway. And I remember, uh, I think I was walking from car, a main building to, um, to, the, to the Kaiser Chapel. I think it must have been a Tuesday or something. And uh, you saw me and you just invited me over for uh, some conversation. And we, had, we used to meet, I think every Tuesday, as a pastors for Africa scholars with uh, um, a friend from Nigeria and another friend from Sierra Leone. And just to talk about the two questions, who is Jesus and what does it mean to follow him? Uh, I cannot overstate how those sessions were quite helpful for me, just not only just to keep my spiritual um, health there and growing, but also to get acquainted to the campus, to feel at home. Uh, just, just getting someone who took interest in us was quite, quite helpful. And so thank you, Tom. Um, oh, yes. Very, very, very thankful. Now for, uh, for those of you again who are joining, Lampposts is hosted by Veracity Found, which is a ministry located in Kampala, Uganda, that seeks to resource the Ugandan church or to equip the Ugandan church. And we do so through theological research and theological resources. The sort of research that we do, some of you might have seen it on our website, um, Making Faneru Manifest. But also we have a public library in uh, Bokoto if you are around Kenjoy supermarket, just behind it. It's always open Monday to Saturday from uh, 9 to 5 p.m. So come along uh, or pass by, pick a book from the shelf, read, study, research, and feel at home. Uh, we do have, of course, other activities, uh, small group Bible studies. We do have uh, every month we meet still in Vukoto for fireplace conversations where we just look at the Ugandan and African church history. Although this month or next month we'll be looking at as well, um, a bit of the reformation and, and how we do get our roots as protesters. But today we will be looking at soul care amidst chaos. Uh, most of us are involved in you know, various activities. We are, at, we are at work, we are at school, and we find ourselves quite busy. And sometimes to the neglect of our souls, to the neglect of our, our, our spiritual care, our devotional life. And so um, today we'll be speaking about that. How do we maintain a healthy soul? How do we care for our souls 
even when we are engaged in the busyness, and that's B-U-S-Y, uh, busyness of life. And today, again, we are privileged to host Dr. Tom Fizemeyer, a former dean at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary in uh, South Hamilton, Massachusetts, and professor who taught me spiritual formation again. Um, and I will let him introduce himself a bit more. And uh, we will be having a different session today than we used to we are used to where he will be presenting to us in a lecture format, sort of. Today, which will be a more conversation or so. As we do have those conversations, please, please do remember to type your questions in the chat and uh, be ready to ask them when we are done with the initial stage, the one hour or so of the conversation, be ready to have them uh, in the chat box so that we can ask them to him and uh, have him respond them to us. But for now, uh, Tom, uh, if you might just introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell us a, a bit more of your ex your expert expertise and what you've done and your history, your ministry involvement, just a little bit for people to get to know you. Oh, great. Well, for, first of all, Joseph, thank you for the invitation and thank you all for attending this session. And I hope it will be helpful to you. That has been my prayer that um, what I have to say to you will resonate, that it will be uh, a word for you um, that encourages you in your own spiritual life. So thank you for the opportunity to be with you and to, and to share today. Um, just quickly, my own background is I became a Christian after college. Um, and so my walk with Christ has been one of well over 40 years now. I'm not going to get too specific on the details there, but that'll give you the basic picture. Um, from the very beginning, I was trained to think of spiritual care as an important part of what it means to live out the Christian life. And so the, the friend of mine who led me to Christ uh, helped me understand the importance of prayer and reading scripture and doing those basic things early in the morning. So I started my Christian life um, with those disciplines in place. Um, I attended Gordon Conwell myself and some other seminaries and, and entered pastoral ministry. And I found, as probably many of you who are in ministry are aware, and those of you who work just and live your lives, uh, things get busy and things become more difficult and time becomes more precious. And that was the case for me. Uh, I, I was working full time as a pastor. I had three children. I was in graduate school full time. Joseph, you know the pain of that. And um, and my wife was also working full time. And we actually had our third child during some of those years. They were very, very busy years. Um, and the temptation was always to cut out the time I had with God because I had more important things to do. Uh, there is nothing more important to do than nurture that relationship with God. And um, but as time went by, I found that I was reading the Bible and actually I got into a habit at one point. I'd go out to a coffee shop with my Bible and I'd have coffee. I'd read the Bible and I would read whatever topic I happened to be reading on for uh, that season. And what happened was my prayer life grew to be rather shallow. And we came into a season of uh, some really profoundly difficult things that we had to do ministry wise. And the Lord really said to me, you know what, your roots are not deep enough. Um, you are going to have to, you are going to have to spend more time with me if you're going to do what I'm calling you to do. And this just became very, very clear to me in that season of ministry, in that season of my life. And so uh, I stopped going to the coffee shop and I started to stay at home. I put a little devotional area in the basement where my study was. And every morning I would come, usually between 6 and 6.30 in the morning. And God and I would begin the day together in scripture and in prayer. And it was a much more focused time. I wasn't doing external reading um, uh, in, during those times. I was just devoted to trying to listen to God, to hear what he had to say in his word. And um, I think what I would like to share with you is that this is just essential. If you were going to survive as a Christian, whatever, whatever your vocation, whatever God calls you to do, if you're going to survive and grow and really be a person who matures in Christ, there's no substitute. There's no substitute for this time with God. I was uh, talking with a graduate student uh, who's working on a PhD, and it's not Joseph. 
uh, someone in a different continent, as a matter of fact. Um, and I asked this particular person, I said, so how's your devotional life? And they said, well, I really don't have time to pray very much. You know, I have kids and I'm, I'm doing my doctorate and I just don't have time to pray. And I said, well, well, what time do you get up? And this person said to me, well, about 7, 7.30 in the morning. I said, well, get up earlier. <laughs> um, there's always time to pray. Sometimes we have to make that time. And sometimes it's a little bit of a discipline. I had a, a young man actually just Sunday at the church that I attend who said he'd had a really hard week. And he just started to get up earlier in the morning and praying. And I said, well, that's a good habit. I said, but um, stay with it. Let this become part of your life. Let this become the way your day begins. Because when you begin the day this way, then the frame for your day feels very different. You process things differently. When you start the day in prayer and meditation and in uh, time with God in the scriptures, this changes the way you do your day. Um, what I used to tell my students, and Joseph would attest to this, is basically, uh, if you don't have an approach that starts with devotion to God, your, your ministry will burn out. Uh, you just, you, you can't run on empty. You've got to keep the divine gas in the tank, so to speak. So the way to do that is through communion with God every day. And as you do that, I think God in his mercy and his spirit... Um, continues to be faithful to us to fuel our ministries again whether you're working directly in the church whether you're working in a vocation that's serving people in a very in a particular way whatever it is if it's grounded in god uh it will be fruitful and jesus said unless we abide in him uh the you can forget about the fruit the fruit comes through abiding no abiding no fruit and we abide as we start the day in uh, scripture, in prayer, in meditation. And that has been, for me, um, a discipline that I have had going on for over 40 years in my life. And some days it meant getting up earlier than other days, some seasons getting up earlier than other seasons. Um, but I have tried to maintain that discipline all through my life. And to be honest with you, I don't think I would have survived in my ministry had I not done that. Yeah, that's 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 quite helpful. Um, I guess one question that might come from what you just said is, and I don't know about you, but maybe some of us might testify that it's easy to, in a sense, not be consistent with your devotions. There is a sense in which if you miss times, it's easier to miss more times. And yet, when you actually begin studying your, your, your Bible, when you begin praying, you begin, you, you wonder how did I make it thus far? Or how did I survive those days without being this consistent? So how, when there are those days when you don't feel like, again, you might give excuses that you don't have time, that, you know, there is, there are more things to do or better things to do. How do you train yourself to actually come back to that devotional life, even when there are many things screaming at you and demanding your attention? How do you, how do you shut them out from your ear or from your mind? Well, I think part of it is you have to believe what's true. Mm -hmm. And what's, true. so, you know, uh, the, the word conversion really means to rethink, huh? metanoia, right? So you have to be converted to the reality that there is nothing more important than spending time with God. There's nothing more important. I don't, you know, unless it's, you know, somebody's, you got to take somebody to the hospital, maybe, um, you know, but but by and large, it becomes a habit. And uh, some have said that, you know, our character is simply the accumulation of our habits. And um, there's some truth to that, I think. So the things that we do habitually are the things that form and shape our character. And this is certainly true in terms of our, um, our relationship with God. So I think one thing is, if you miss a day or what, you know, whatever happens, um, don't beat yourself up for it. Number one, don't, don't get into the self-condemnation and all that. Just say, Lord, tomorrow, let's start again. And let's, let's, let's confess that I didn't make it today, okay? But tomorrow, can we start all over? Can we make a fresh start? And day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, um, that, that morning time with God becomes habitual and you become a different person 
as a result of that time. I don't know how else to put it. And when after a while, uh, and in fact, this young man I was talking to just the other day, he said, you know, I'm really noticing um, now I've been doing this for a few days. I really notice it makes a difference in my day. I said, yeah, it does. That's the point. Communion with time, uh, with God changes the way we do our day. And um, it changes who we are over time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very helpful. Um, Tom, are there some verses or a verse that is quite helpful for you um, that informs your perspective or even your devotional life or your desire to actually be consistent in your devotional life? One or two or three that you might have in mind. Yeah, and thanks for asking that. Um, and um, yes, there are. And when I think about what God is doing with us when it comes to who we are and how he is shaping us, more importantly, who he's shaping us to be, there are several texts that come to mind from the Bible, and I've, I've got a couple of them here. Um, and, and you can write these down if you're taking notes or open up a Bible if you have one or, uh, you know, whatever your phone, whatever you're looking at. Um, but one of them, and Joseph, you may or may not remember this, but I actually would open the course, spiritual formation course, with these, these verses. They're from Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. And uh, most scholars of the Psalms believe that Psalm 1 is actually kind of an invitation into the whole book of Psalms. Um, and it's kind of setting the table for the whole book. But these three opening verses um, have been formative for me in terms of how I think about soul care or how I think about the spiritual life. So this is what the psalmist says. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he and on his law he meditates day and night. Now I want to pause there for a moment. Um, ask yourself: Is your delight in the scriptures? In other words, do you come to the scriptures kind of going, "Oh, I got to suck it up and do my devotional time," and it's just, "Oh," or do you come with a sense of delight? knowing that you're going to meet God in his word. And that is always an experience of delight and of joy, is to be, to, to be present to God and experience God's presence with you. And then it says that he meditates on this law. The person who does this meditates on God's law day and night. Um, the word in Hebrew for this has to do, if you will, with uh, chewing the cud. Uh, as an animal does, it regurgitates its food. And so to uh, to meditate on it means really to chew on God's word, to let it sink in and really uh, chew on it. There's a wonderful book, talks about this, some um, uh, Eugene Peterson's book, Eat This Book, which means eat the Bible. And he's taking that uh, from the Old Testament um, book of Ezekiel. And um, But the image is that we do, we want to chew on God's word. So the person who delights in the law of the Lord and who chews on God's word, well, what difference does that make? Well, the psalmist tells us in the next couple of verses, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now let's, let's just spend a couple of minutes with that. So what good does having joy in God's law and God's word do? What good does meditating, chewing on it, regurgitating it, going over and over it in your mind and your heart? What good does that do? Well, the psalmist says we become like a tree that lives, right? It, it has water, so it's living, and it's bearing fruit. And I would guess if I asked each one of you, and if I had the opportunity to sit down and have a coffee or whatever with you, and said, so what do you want in life? You would say, I want my life to mean something. I want it to bear fruit for God and for his kingdom. If you want your life to bear fruit, then you have to put your roots down by the living water. And that living water is found in Jesus and his word. 
So if you want to bear fruit, this is how you do it. That's what the psalmist is telling us. So this, this passage has always been formative for me in terms of thinking about what it is to have a tree that's putting down deep roots so that it can spare a lot of fruit. And I used to terrify my students then by showing them pictures of uprooted trees who had shallow root beds and trees falling on houses that had shallow root beds. Joseph's nodding. He may remember that. And I said to them, this is what your ministry is going to be if you don't grow deep roots. Because not only do you harm your own soul, your own character, but you also harm the church. That's the image of the, the tree that falls on the house, right? There's, there's repercussions to you not having a grounded and rooted soul. Because your ministry, either in your workplace, wherever your vocation is, wherever God calls you, your ministries and your churches... Uh, whether you're working there full time or you're you're serving there in other ways, are impacted by the depth of your rootedness. So here's the thing: the principle is: the deeper the roots, the greater the fruits. The deeper the roots, the greater the fruits. How do we deepen our roots? Through spending time with God during the day. So that's that's one scripture text. Another scripture text that is meaningful to me, and actually our pastor. Uh, just preached on it yesterday a little bit. It was kind of fun to hear it again. Um, this is from Jeremiah, and instead of the agricultural image of the tree and the fruit and the root and that sort of thing, uh, this is the image, you're familiar with it, I hope, from the potter's shed. So when God is trying to teach Jeremiah about the spiritual life, about soul care, about who he is, he takes him down to the potter's shed and he says, listen and pay attention when you get down there. So this is Jeremiah 18, 1 through 4. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands. And he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. So we are the pot and God is the potter. So I think of my time in the morning as going down to the potter's shed um, and being aware of the fact that God is shaping and forming uh, my soul. That's, that's what that time is all about, is for me to, to hear his word, to listen to it, to ponder it, to chew on it, uh, and to feel God's, God's shaping of my soul in that. Um, he's, he's setting the contours of my soul. I have a, actually, I have a piece of pottery that I got in Israel many years ago from the, it's dated from the time of David. And you can actually see where the potter's fingers were. You can see the striations uh, in the clay that has been now around for whatever that is, 1400 years. Um, it's, and it's an extraordinary thing to think about how the the fingers, the hands of the potter shapes the clay. And God says, you're the, you're the pot, I'm the potter. I'm the one who shapes and forms your life. And so that image uh, of the potter and the potter's house has always been an image in my mind of God's work in my life. And what, why, does, why does a potter make a pot? He makes a pot to be serviceable, to be used for good purposes. And so God does that work in us, and he does that work primarily through his word and in the spirit and in prayer. That's where the primary work goes. We'll talk about some other pieces of that a little bit. And then uh, the third verse, which is actually really one of my favorite verses in all of scripture, because I think, again, it goes to the issue of what God is doing in our lives. This is 2 Corinthians 3, uh, 18. And um, Paul is talking about what God is doing. And I just, I just love this. He says, and we all with unveiled faces, he's been talking about Moses and the covenant. He says, we with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord. And here's, here's the key phrase. Are being transformed into the same image, meaning into the image of the Lord from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. You know, um, Paul asks the question at one point, he says, what is God's will for you? 
And everybody wants to know that. What's God's will for me? Is it to is it to marry her or to marry him? Is it to have this great job? Is it to succeed in my ministry? What is God's will for you? And you know what Paul's answer to that is? Your sanctification. This is God's will for you, your sanctification. That's what Paul says. So what's going on? What is sanctification? Well, it's this, it's this changing from glory to glory. It's becoming more and more like Christ. That is all that God is doing. That's the, that's the key project. Uh, I like to think of it as that's the house that God is building, and everything he uses to build it is the scaffolding around it. Uh, you know, the relationships we have, the jobs we have, the opportunities in life, the places where we serve, all of the activity of life is in one way or another to be understood as the scaffolding. And of course, all that scaffolding comes down when we die. And then the question is, what do we see? And hopefully what we see is a life that has been transformed from glory to glory uh, so that we are experiencing what it means to become like Christ and uh, to serve him in every way that we can. But that's the end game is the shaping of our soul for the glory of God to resemble and to look like God. That's, you know, of course, the word Christian means little Christ, right? To look like Christ. So that's the thing. So those are three passages. One's kind of an agricultural metaphor. One is a metaphor from making pots. And then the last one is kind of really just looking at what God is really doing. He's transforming us from glory to glory. That's the, that's the task. That's the main thing that God is doing. So those are some passages Joseph, that I've been helpful in my own thinking about what God is up to here. Amen. Uh, the Second Corinthians uh, three eighteen as well is one of my very very favorite uh, yeah. passages. Yeah. <laughs> of course, Psalm one. We uh, we were we were asked to memorize Psalm one in our Hebrew class. It was it was fun. Um, it it doesn't leave you the same as well. Just that that habit of meditating on God's word and the way it shapes your thinking, the way it shapes your perspectives and your convictions. It's just fascinating. It's fascinating what the spirit of God can do with the word of God memorized at heart. But um, you, you talked about the Jeremiah passage and the imagery of a potter and the forming the, the vessel and all that. And of course, you also mentioned the idea of scaffolding. And maybe that raises a question as to whether there is a difference between a spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines. Yes. Yeah. So I would say that spiritual formation is the, the overarching theme. But in other words, what we just looked at in second corinthians the idea of being changed from glory to glory that's the overarching thing this is god's end game with us what he's doing with us and then the spiritual disciplines are tools that god uses to achieve his purpose and his end so if we go back to the potter i actually have a sister who's a potter and i don't know a lot about it but i've watched her do some of this work and she has a lot of tools in her part of pottery shop that she uses as she's shaping a bowl or as she's shaping, uh, I have communion cups actually that she's made. <clears throat> as she is shaping the work, she has particular tools that she'll use to trim or she'll use a, a wire to kind of bring indentation or to do some kind of shaping or she'll have a, a flat, um, like a trowel kind of thing that she uses to smooth things. So the potter is using tools to do the shaping. And I think the spiritual disciplines are tools that God uses, and these are tools that have been found uh, purposeful and useful throughout the history of the church, and these are tools that God gives us as, as we're being shaped and as we're being formed. So that's how I see the disciplines. And, 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 and what would be some of those spiritual disciplines that are quite, quite important for our spiritual formation? Good. Uh, yeah, I think one of the things I would preface by saying there are a lot of lists of these that various teachers in this area uh, use. Some people say there are five. Some people say there's seven. Some people a dozen. I don't think that's really the, the point as much as to understand that there are some, some basic tools that we have uh, God's made available to us. And it's, it's kind of interesting because he brings us into the shaping a little bit. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing. But to look at what some of the, I mean, clearly the, the, the key basic tool 
is the Bible itself. Uh, this is the primary tool that God uses. His word, um, which we don't just read objectively, but we read in it and under it. Um, I go back and say what I one image I like to think of, uh, and especially as Joseph, as we read the Bible, what difference it makes. I think the image of being marinated. I, I like to cook, and I like to cook meat, <laughs> and um, and I like to marinate meat because it it flavors better. But how does meat get marinated? Well, it has to soak. It has to soak in the marinade. And when we come and spend time in the Bible, we become soaked in its view of life. And we begin to take on its flavor and its aroma in our way of thinking and our way of acting. And so to be soaked in the Bible, uh, I, I think is really uh, one of the key ways I like to think about it. So the Bible, first and foremost, uh, and, and with the Bible comes this idea of meditation. Uh, so we read the text. And then we meditate on it, right? That's the, the part where we're chewing on it, chewing on it. It might be a word that comes to you. It might be an idea or a thought, something that kind of pops off the text. Sometimes for me, it's something that I'm like, ooh, I don't know if I like that. Uh, it's often a place where God is challenging me to regroup my thinking. And so uh, to begin then to meditate, med Bible reading and meditation go together. And all of that shapes our prayer. All of that shapes our prayer life. So prayer flows out of reading and meditation. Then we begin to pray, and we pray in the Word, and sometimes even in the words of Scripture itself. We can let those words be our prayer, and that's a beautiful way to pray. The Psalms are especially helpful here. Um, but to be able to enter into prayer, so it's the reading and the meditation, and then the, the, the time of actual prayer and then resting is all part of how we interact with the Bible and the Scripture. So I would I, I kind of see that as a unit, if you will. Uh, one of the one of the tools um, is Bible reading with prayer and meditation and uh, understanding how the Scripture all fits together. That's one kind of piece. And then I would say another piece uh, is corporate worship. This is one of the disciplines of the spiritual life. I get really nervous around people who say, "Well, I'm a Christian, but I don't have an, I don't, I don't go to church." Um, I think that's pretty unsustainable. The Book of Hebrews counsels against it and says, "No, don't, don't give up, say, the, don't give up meeting together." Um, and it's been hard, right, because of COVID. I don't know how it is over where you all are situated, but in this country, it's been hard. We're having a problem getting people back to church. And, um, you know, people are still, they're kind of, they've fallen out of the habit. I talked to a guy the other day, he's a friend of mine, strong Christian guy, but he's not gone back to church. He just sits back online and watches it at home. Um, and that's okay. And we made it through COVID doing that. Some of us did. But, you know, we, we need to be in an incarnated community. So to be in Christian community is important. And, and by that, I don't just mean going to church. It certainly starts there. It includes corporate worship with other Christians, but also to be in a small group with people. Joseph, you'll remember that that was a requirement of our spiritual formation class was that you met together in a small group for the, the term uh, that we had the course. And I did that intentionally because Christian fellowship is really important. Um, we've just gone through a different, difficult season in our lives uh, my wife was diagnosed with breast cancer, and she's doing fine. She's had surgery, and she's doing well. But it was remarkably important uh, and so helpful for us to have people that we know who love the Lord, and they just gathered around us and said, we're going to pray for you. We're going to come over. We're going to bring meals. We're going to, you know, and they just, just wrap themselves around us in such a wonderful way. So community is also a spiritual discipline. And it's an important discipline. And again, it's part of that formation that we've been talking about. Um, I would say the uh, celebration of Sabbath. Um, there's a reason we have a Sabbath in the Bible. And I don't know, I, I may be wrong here, but I don't know of any other ancient people who had a Sabbath. It's part of their part of their uh, regime. Um, I think this is one of the greatest. It, it was it was very revolutionary to the extent that um, the you know the Egyptians and the you know the Roman Empire thought the Jews were quite lazy 
to have a, a day set apart for rest. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but here, you know, but, uh, and I don't know, again, how it is in the African context in your various uh, countries and situations who are attending this, but uh, Americans are really bad at resting. We're just not good at it. And this, I think, is really a spiritual problem for people in this country. Um, I talk to people who just, you know, they, they're very proud of the fact that they work 70 hours a week and they love it that way. Um, it's not healthy. And I've had that conversation with people who have been offended by the fact that I've suggested it's not healthy. I think you've got to work what you've got to work, but you have to, the point is, are you taking rest? Because rest is an expression of your confidence in God to provide for you. And rest is needed in order to live a healthy and balanced life. And that's why God gave us the Sabbath. Jesus said he didn't give it to you to, to make himself different or better. He gave it to you because you need it, right? But the Lord gave us, um, he did not make man for the Sabbath. He made the Sabbath for man. The Sabbath is God's gift to humanity, right? That's why Jesus said we need to keep the Sabbath. And so there you have it. So Sabbath is an important principle. And I, I think it's actually good uh, in a sort of a way to extrapolate out from that, to do some things. Uh, again, Joseph, you will remember we had a soul Sabbath that was a course requirement. And this involved, for the rest of you, it involved getting off campus for a day and just spending time with God. It was kind of a structured day. You know, we had readings to do and scripture to read and times for prayer and times for kind of gathering corporately in the small groups to talk about it. But um, to do a soul Sabbath from time to time is really helpful too, I think. So Sabbath is a, one of the principles. Yeah, um, maybe just, just on that, uh, when you mentioned soul Sabbath, I remember the experience of having your phone away and just being silent alone with God's word. It, it was torturous at the start because I think we are quite used to the distractions of life and there are things that we make ourselves believe that we can't do away with. But that experience of just having your phones away, even I remember it, you know, eating lunch without having to speak, uh, needing salt and pointing and saying, yeah, that, that, that one. But it, it was quite, quite helpful. I uh, just, just wanted to mention that. And, and maybe it's a, it's a practice that we may want to hear a little bit more about how we could actually cultivate that as individuals uh, in our yeah. busy schedules. How do we develop that habit of, because usually when we think about rest, we tend to think about spiritual rest, you know, come to me or you who are weary and heavy laden and I'll give you rest. But we don't see the relationship between the spiritual rest and the physical rest. We tend to separate the two. Um, and so I wonder if, if there are some, some, a few things you could mention about that. How do we develop that habit? How do we cultivate that discipline of actually having the time set apart for resting? Not watching TV, not watching uh, soccer, but just resting and maybe meditating more on God's word. Yeah, so two of, the, two of the components, I think, that make a soul Sabbath a soul Sabbath uh, are silence and solitude. So to be alone and to be quiet. And I'm actually doing, I'm writing a book right now and I'm talking about in one part of the book, the problems that we have, at least in this country, with silence and solitude. And silence and solitude are frightening for us because all the questions that we push down that we don't wanna deal with that make us nervous, like does life have meaning? Does my life have purpose? What is the meaning of what my direction in life? All those kinds of questions bubble up when it's quiet and there's solitude. And this is where God begins to come to us and ask us questions. Um, one famous author once said, beware of him who comes and knows how to ask questions. And God is the ultimate questioner. A you know, Adam, Eve, where are you? You know, the questions that come. Um, so for us to quiet ourselves is actually a benefit. And to be alone and quiet and with the word of God is actually beneficial because it's only when the noise level comes down and the distraction level goes away that we can hear the voice of God. And so we want to create spaces in our lives where we can simply be quiet before the Lord and where we can be attentive to his word. And we will find rest for our souls when we do that. But in order to do it, we have to plan it. 
uh, you know, I, we're planners around here, so we're always planning stuff. So if I'm going to have a soul Sabbath day, then I need to plan it and I need to make sure that other responsibilities are covered and I can just go and take that time. And maybe it's a half a day, you know, maybe it's maybe it's just a few hours and you do it once a quarter or something. I don't know. Everybody has to find their own pattern. But what my point is, is you will find it restful and it, it amounts to kind of a reset. Uh, of your heart and of your mind. And in the spiritual tradition, by the way, the heart, the mind descends into the heart. Um, so the, don't distinguish too too much between them. They're actually to work together in the in the Christian classic spiritual tradition. Um, and so that's the kind of thing we need. And um, it helps us to regather our senses, our spiritual senses about what's true and about what's real. Um, one of my favorite writers, a guy named Thomas Merton, said we we spend our our whole lives trying to climb up the ladder, only to realize at the end that we've had it leaned against the wrong roof. <laughs> and think about that. What are we actually trying to do? And sometimes we achieve what we think we want to do, only to realize that we've leaned our lives against the wrong roof. Well, it's not where it's not where we wanted to end up, but we bought the world's story about fame and fortune and we pursued those paths and we've ended up as bankrupt people as a result spiritually bankrupt so i think that's that's an important uh, element um service i think is another piece of it that we want to be people who serve others uh that was what really what our sermon at church was about yesterday was how do we how do we develop the heart of jesus which is a heart of serving son of man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So what does it mean to develop that heart and to live that life of service out? Fasting is another spiritual um, discipline. And I'll be honest with you, I don't, I'm not a big faster. I'm just not good at it. I know it doesn't seem to help me. Um, but fasting has been very helpful for many people, especially when combined with prayer. So that's something I think to consider. Uh, another thing, and again, Joseph, you'll remember this journaling. <laughs> so, um, and I'm not a great journaler, to be honest. I made my students do it, um, but I'm not very good at it myself. Once in a while, I'll do a little journaling, but that's just not been a problem. I'm very introspective anyway, so I don't, that doesn't seem to add much for me. But for many people um, to, to be journaling a little bit as part of their devotional quiet time is very helpful and very useful. And um, I used to review those when you when you as students would give them to me twice a, during the semester. Um, and I tried not to, you know, read them in a sense of prying, but uh, also just to say, you know, wow, this person really seems to be, there's a lot going on. You could just tell by the amount of pages that were written that they were, this was a fruitful exercise for them. And then the one of the other things that I think is important is, um, and you wouldn't think of this as a spiritual discipline necessarily, but celebration. Celebration. And um, I have a daughter who's very, very good at this. When she and her team achieve something in the business she's in, they go out and celebrate. And they have a, they have a celebration, a party. Um, and, you know, they go and just have a wonderful time together and celebrate and enjoy that. And um but, you know, there's a lot about celebration in the Bible, and the key uh, image, really, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, comes down to uh, the feast of the kingdom of God. Um, that's a celebration, you know, so we have celebration in Scripture for us, as, a, as the, um, the end game is to celebrate being in the presence of God forever, and that takes the image of a wedding feast, and Jesus talks about that. He's the, he's the, uh, the bridegroom. And the church is the bride. And so this image of celebrating and having joy together uh, is, is wonderful. And I think Christians need to celebrate. We need to be people of celebration. We just celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. That's the celebration of all celebrations in this world. And um, we need to, you know, every Sunday should be a celebration of the resurrection in some dimension or, or another. That's why the church changed its worship day and doesn't worship on the Sabbath. We worship on the day of the Lord's resurrection. And there's a reason for that. So to celebrate the resurrection, we need to live as people who are people of the resurrection who know how to celebrate, not some frivolous kind of thing, 
but to, just to celebrate the goodness of God when we experience that in special ways, just to, to pause and make it a vertical celebration, right? Where we're engaging God in the celebration and uh, we're recognizing that it's God that we have to thank for this good moment in our lives. So those are, those are some thoughts on the spiritual disciplines that support the overall project of our for, the formation of our souls. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. Um, I suspect most of us are surprised by the celebration uh, being a spiritual discipline. But yeah, I think uh, the idea of rejoicing and, and um, finding joy with the community of believers, uh, especially in light of what God has done for us, um, could be quite, quite helpful. Um, maybe just before I ask maybe the next question, please remember to send in your question just for uh, Dr. Tom. Uh, we should be having a time of of uh, responding to that in the chat uh, feel free to send those questions in um but but a, a quick question and maybe crucial for those who are either pastors or uh into pastoral ministry um is especially with the business and the responsibilities that you face uh you're visiting a church member you are preparing summons uh you're doing this and this and that um, there can be a temptation of perhaps doing uh, more things or probably being engaged in much activity and less um, involved in uh, spiritual disciplines. How, what, what would you say of those who would say, I would rather do more, maybe the Martha type, than be in that regard? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think what I would say is you can only give in ministry who you are in Christ. And I'll say that again, because I think I just said that for the first time in my own thinking. Um, <laughs> that's rather marvelous. <laughs> um, we can only give in our ministry who we are in Christ. And, um, you know, Paul says to the Corinthians, it kind of sneaks it in there. I can't remember exactly where it is, but he says, you know, we have, we have given to you, I think it's Corinthians, we've given to you our very selves, maybe Thessalonians. But uh, think of that, it's remarkable. So I would say to you as people who are full-time pastors or ministers or involved in ministry, at the end of the day, all you have to give is who you are in Jesus Christ. And all the other stuff that you think you have to give uh, is nowhere near as important as who you are and the love that he has poured out in you and through you is the most important thing you have to share. And where does that love come from? And how is it shaping your soul? Well, if you're not spending that time with the divine lover, um, you probably don't have a lot of love to share. And I've seen a lot of ministry done. And in honesty, uh, I've done a lot of ministry that has not been rooted in love. It's been rooted in other things. Um, wanting to get things done, wanting to achieve, wanting to accomplish, um, wanting to perform well. Uh, I've done a lot of ministry that was not done in love. And, and so to always remember that who we are is more important than what we do. We are human beings before we're human doings. And we get that. We, we oftentimes, the temptation in ministry is performative, you know, to perform well for Christ. Um, and I just, I, I just don't think that's the right, the right way to go at it. I think it's about becoming like him, and then letting him use you however he wants to use you. There are certain responsibilities we have with, there are things that we need to do, but all of that, uh, you know, it's 1 Corinthians 13. I can do all of this stuff, but if I do it without love, meaning if I'm, my soul is not centered in the love of Jesus, then it's, you know, empty gong or noisy gong clanging cymbal kind of stuff. Um, it's not it's not effective because it's not rooted in Christ. It's just performance stuff. Yeah, that, that's that's quite quite helpful. Um, so Rogers is asking a question about whether the amount of time you spend in devotion matters. Okay, good. So now I'm going to tell a story, Roger. Thank you for asking that. I'm going to tell a story. So I, I have a friend. Uh, he actually lives out near me now. Uh, his name is his name is Jim, 
And the thing you need to know about Jim is back in the day, he's he's 75 now, but back in the day, he used to run ultra marathons, 50s and 100s. And he's actually run five 100 mile marathons. So Jim, a few years ago, and when I say a few, I probably mean 10 or 15, um, I, I found out that Jim was going to go over and run the Paris Marathon. Now, I'm not I'm not a runner. So to me, the idea of being able to run five miles is miraculous. OK, but Jim was going to go over and he was going to run the Paris Marathon. So he went over and did that. And um, while he was in Paris, he discovered that uh, the London Marathon was the next weekend. So he thought, well, that's cool. I'll just stay and run London next weekend. And I thought, I, I could no more do that than I could fly to the moon. And the question is why? And the question, and the answer is, is because Jim was always in training. He was always in training. I asked him one time, I said, how many, I, I know you've run five 100 mile marathons. How many 50s have you run? He said, uh, probably 15 or 20. And I said, well, how many marathons have you run? I knew I knew he had run the Boston Marathon twice. I said, how many marathons have you run? He goes, oh, Tom, I don't know. We used to do them as training runs. And my point is, because of his training regime, he was always fit. And whenever an opportunity to run a race came, he was ready to go. And I would say the same thing is true in the spiritual life. It's the constant training, the constant um, utilizing of the spiritual disciplines that shapes and forms our character. So when challenges come and opportunities arise to do something, we're good to go. You can't start training for a marathon the day of the marathon. You have to be ready to run the marathon on the day of the marathon. And that happens through constant discipline, constant training. And the same thing I think is true in the spiritual life. So Roger, I, I hope that answers your question or at least obliquely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, again, just to remind us, uh, please uh, be like Rogers and uh, <laughs> send in your questions um, constantly. Um, Geoffrey does ask a question as well um, concerning the various spiritual disciplines that you mentioned. And he says he gets a sense like, some of those disciplines might be quite more important than the others. And the question really is, which one of those that you mentioned do you think are a bit more important than the rest? Um, yeah, I think I, I put them in order that I think is important to some degree. So for me, it's always about, and all, everything starts with is centered in uh, reading scripture, prayer, devotion, meditation, that's where everything starts. I think all the other things are also part of it and are also important. But if you don't have that at the core, um, then I think the rest of it can, can easily become performative. In other words, you just do it to get results rather than coming out of a heart, out of a heart of love and compassion, which is what happens when we spend time with God we, we begin to see the heart of God, and we begin to see the compassion of God. I think, uh, Joseph, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think chesed is used about 246 times in the Old Testament. This word in Hebrew that is the steadfast love of God, sometimes translated covenant love, covenant loyalty. But we begin to, the more time we spend with God, the more loving we become if we're if we're entering into and spending time in the presence of God and reflecting on his love, receiving his love, again, like a marinade that seeps into our our soul and it changes who we are. And so it, it, again, and it goes back to who we are rather than what we do. Um, and it's very easy to get into the what we do modality as being the most important because we can measure that. We can measure our performance. Well, I, I held this many Bible studies, or I did this many funerals, or I did this many outreach events, or I evangelized this many people, I led this many people to Jesus. Those are all great things, but when we slip into that performative doing modality, we lose the heart of who we are. And so we want to spend time in those disciplines 
that change our character and change our person. And if, you, if you're asking me, I think that's the core of it and everything else flows outward from that. Remember the root comes first, then the fruit. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, maybe another question could be, so you, you know, the, it's perhaps easier to uh, develop that personal individual spiritual disciplines and devotional life, as you mentioned, the student whom you told, you know, if you're waking up at 7.30, you could perhaps try waking up a bit earlier. But if you, how, how do you, especially us as, 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 as people who have a family, how do you develop that family devotional life? And maybe this ties into the whole, the communal, you know, communal, a fellowship and all that being part of the spiritual disciplines how how do you as as a family or how did you as a family develop that sort of consistent devotional life <laughs> i've been talking uh pretty much about my own devotional life here at this point um but i yeah. think i think you know we we're we were a very typical american family in that we were very busy and our kids were involved in various things and, and quite frankly at one point my wife and i just shut the whole thing down because it was killing us as a family. We were just way over programmed and we just shut everything down and said, no, 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 we're, we're, we're all going crazy here. But I think uh, mealtime uh, is an important thing. And I think probably African culture is a lot smarter than American culture on this. And, and at least in my experience talking with you guys, Joseph, um, Mealtime used to be a big thing in this country. It's kind of fallen away and people are grabbing fast food and running to meetings and rehearsals and practices and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I was always big on mealtime in our house and that everybody would be home for dinner. And it was at dinner then that we would talk about um, what was important during the day, that we would have spiritual conversations about, okay, well, how are you dealing with that? What, you know, Where's God in that for you? And so to be able to have some spiritual conversation was for us usually around the the uh, the table. We usually around the table. Yeah, okay. Um, and thank you for that. Um, so again, feel free to keep your questions coming uh, in the chat. Uh, this This should perhaps as well tie into what I had asked a little bit earlier. So the student that, again, you mentioned, when you're doing, say, doctoral studies, and I suspect this would be the same with pastoral ministry, and since you were a pastor, you could speak uh, into that. There tends to be, or there can be a temptation to um, confuse your time you spend studying the text for maybe someone preparation or maybe for your paper with <laughs> your devotional life. How do you... How do you balance those two? How do you help uh, pastors not to confuse the two and to see that their devotional life is actually rich and it's not merely a, a result or merely tied to their time they, they take to prepare the someone or to prepare for a paper? I think there is a great temptation to overlap those, again, because that way we save time um, and we're able to get things done. And And there were colleagues of of mine at the seminary who thought you know well just do your devotions in hebrew or do them in greek and quite frankly i just disagree with that um i think you should do your devotions in your heart language uh whatever your immediate heart language is that's what you should do because if you're doing it in a second or third language um what you begin to do is focus more on the language and the translational uh difficulties than on the the thing itself so i think my, my sense is that's really important. Um, I had the privilege of preparing sermons every week for 20 years. Um, and so I know the pressure that you're talking about. I also taught twice a week, sometimes three times a week um, during those weeks as well. So the, the pressure of preparation was always upon me. Um, but eventually what I had to realize, and, and again, I, I, I start early in the morning with my own quiet time with God, my own prayer time. But what I, what I came to realize is if that was in place and I was feeling uh, a strong relationship, strongly grounded in God because of my prayer and devotional time, because of hearing his word first and foremost, that the rest of it seemed to flow. 
um, I, I was never a believer in um, letting letting the scripture text for the week become my devotional text. Again, it becomes utilitarian much too quickly if you do that. And now all of a sudden it's just, oh, I'm just utilizing this time and pretending that I'm having this intimate time with God when I'm really just working on my sermon. And you have to you have to look at the devotional side of writing a sermon. That's another issue. But it can never be writing sermons can never be a substitute for your own quiet time with God. Uh, that that's my opinion. Not everybody shares it, but that's how I feel about it. And that's not to say that you don't want to be praying through your sermon when you're writing a sermon. You do, but that's on top of this foundation that you've already built uh, early in the day. It's an extension of it, not a substitute for it. Mm -hmm. um, that's helpful. Um especially for me as well. Um, and maybe another question that would come up. So on the one hand, uh, you want to learn or know the whole scriptural story so that even when you're meditating on a text, you are sure that it's within the framework of what some might call the meta-narrative. And so, but to, to gain that holistic understanding of the whole bi biblical story, you definitely would want to read through the whole Bible. And uh, some of those, um, you could say tools, uh, maybe cover to cover, if, I don't know if, if, if you know that, or other reading through the Bible in a year. But the, 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 the difficulty then gets to be that you, with every day for those Bible reading guides, you quite have a lot to read that you might perhaps find it difficult to focus on a text that you can um, meditate on yes. or even memorize. And so how do you get that passage or text that you can zero in and meditate on and memorize while at the same time uh, being able to work towards reading through the whole Bible and gaining the bigger picture of what the Bible is about? Well, I, we haven't talked about this, but I, I actually am doing that very thing right now in my own devotional life. And I have a tool for you um, that was written by a friend of mine out here, a guy that I've known for a number of years. And I'm going to grab it. Just give me a second. I'll grab it. So sure. here my over where I sure. do my prayers. And as he grabs that, uh, again, feel free to send in your questions. Uh, I can see Joshua and, and Rogers. Can you, thank can you. you. Can you read that? I can. Uh, I hope others can. Maybe you can post the name of this uh, on your website for um, yeah. a reference. Yeah, it's, um, it's Discover the Bible. So this, this, it's Rediscovering yeah, the Bible. Can you read the subtitle? Not clearly. Okay, so the subtitle is, or discover it for the first time. Uh, and uh, it's called A Devotional Guide to the Bible. And then it's written by a guy named Michael Pickard, P-I-C-K-A-R-D. And Mike is a, a friend of mine, and he's a retired Presbyterian pastor. And he wrote this book uh, several years ago. and. Um, I've just decided that this year, this was going to be my go-to book. And what I like about it, Joseph, is it does what you're talking about. Um, it takes it, every day of the year, a different chapter and just moving through the book. There are multiple chapters for each day, but he gives you a key text for meditation. So each day, you, you so for example, today, this morning, was day 117, and the scripture is 2 Chronicles 21 through 25. But the key text he gave us, those of us who are reading through, is 2 Chronicles 24, 20. That was what he calls the key text. So that was the text I used to think about, to meditate on this morning. So he he has a thing and it outlines kind of where we are in the biblical narrative. He, give, he always follows the meta narrative. Here's where we are in the meta narrative, and here's kind of a zoom focus down into the text for the day. And the beauty of the book, he keeps bringing you back to the meta narrative as he goes. Um, and then he has, he actually even has a short prayer after his, he has a couple of pages of comments, and then he has a short prayer um, 
that you can pray or use as a jumping off for your own prayer that arises out of the text itself. So it's a nice, it's, I'm really enjoying it. And it's very well written. I'm, I told him, I said, you know, I'm impressed with your writing. So, um, but it's, it's a tool that's trying to do exactly what you're describing. And there, it's, a, it's a year through the Bible. If you have time to read all four chapters for the day and then do it, that's fine. But if you need to do something briefer, you can look at his, what he's writing about the chapters and then zoom in on the key text. So it's a nice, it's a nice tool. Um, mm -hmm. It is, it is important to hold what, what we might call the meta narrative, you know, um, creation, sin, salvation, uh, restoration, hold that, that in, uh, in the back of our minds always is the frame within which we're looking at the story of God. And uh, we, need to, we need to be people who can zoom in and then zoom out uh, and be able to do that in different ways as we read the Bible over time. So uh, how you do that is, is up to you, but that's a tool that's available if you're wanting to do that. Yeah, um, I hope it's uh, available or easily accessible for for uh, some of us, but uh, you could you could check it out. I will perhaps Back on as well. Amazon. And you can you can you do Amazon stuff over there? Uh, yes, we can, but most probably Kindle version might uh, come in more handy. So I yeah. I hope there is a Kindle a Kindle option. Um, but so another question that comes in from Joshua Omodo concerns lament. Would lament be one? Would lament be a spiritual discipline and uh if so or you know uh depending on how you answer as well how do we lament to god about our struggles and you could say the word struggles without being irreverent um is it even a, a legitimate soul care method that's joshua omodo well so lament like like celebration is rooted in scripture itself right so this is not something that's foreign to, I mean, all you've got to do is read the book of Lamentations, uh, read the book of Job. There is serious lament going on uh, in the Bible. So the Bible itself um, honors lament as a mode of expression. And there are times when lament is deeply appropriate. Um, you know, I just, I feel a sense of lamentation almost every day when I get through reading my newspaper. Uh, there's a lot to lament in terms of what's going on in the world. But Christians, the, the trick is, and the key is, that lament needs to be from the heart. It needs to be genuine. Um, but we also need to hold that intention with the hope that we have of a new creation, which has already begun in Christ, right? That's the meaning of a resurrection. A corner has been turned. We are moving into the new creation. It's already underway. Um, and so the lament always has to be framed within hope. In other words, you know, grieve, but not as a people without hope, the Apostle Paul says. And I think that's the thing. I, I, um, I've been interested in looking at Jesus's response to the death of Lazarus. And when you see Jesus's response, um, it's quite interesting. It's twofold in John 11. Jesus, it says that he, the translation is he was deeply disturbed. Um, what that Greek term, ek bruseosai, I think it is, something along those lines, it actually is the word that's used of a horse that is snorting, that's getting ready to go into battle. It's agitated. Uh, this, is, this, this is the image behind that word. So Jesus is getting prepared to do battle with the author of death. And he's like a horse that's pawing and snorting, you know, getting ready to, to get in there and do the battle. That's what that word really means. At the same time, while Jesus is feeling those things, in other words, he's angry about death. He's angry about what Satan has done to Lazarus, and he's going to do something about it. It's his righteous anger, this, this fierce, ready to confront death. Um, at the same time, we're told, of course, that Jesus wept because he sees the impact. He sees the need to lament what has happened to Mary and Martha and to Lazarus's friends. He laments um, the tragedy of death itself. And so we see this, this concept of lamenting is a very real part of human life 
And the beauty of it is, is that God has offered us to come into his presence with our lamentation, that we can come and lament before God, that we can even be angry with God. Some people find that offensive. Well, tell it to the psalmist. Tell it to Job. There's a lot of language that expresses frustration with God, even anger with God. Um, and yet God doesn't push us away. He says, okay, so where are we going to go with this? What are we going to do? So the, the invitation to lamentation, I think, is important. There were a couple of uh, Gordon Conwell folks, I think, that wrote a book on a little um, a little small book about the importance of lamentation several years ago. I think I have it sitting on one of the shelves behind me, actually. But um, lamentation is a, it's a super important part of the spiritual life. It's part of being real in this world, of taking seriously the groaning and the painting and the the longing of creation to be restored. Um, when you're when you're serving in ministry with people, you have an opportunity to lament a lot because you see a lot of pain and suffering and death. Um, that's grounds for lamentation, but we do not grieve, as Paul says, as a people with no hope. That's the frame within which the lamentation happens. Thank you. Um, thank you for that response. Uh, please keep keep your questions still coming in. Thank you for those of you who have already um, sent in your questions. Uh, Manzi does uh, did post a link to the Amazon uh, the Amazon link to the book. Um, you know, rediscover the Bible the first time. Did you find, uh, did you find a Kindle version? Yes. Uh, Robert uh, Stallard Bob tells me that there is a Kindle uh, option, and so for those would love to grab one for yourselves, uh, please feel free to do so. Uh, minute, sorry, uh, I, need, I need to mute uh, that. But so uh, please, please keep, keep your questions coming. There is one that comes from Jackie uh, Chikome and it ties into perhaps one that I had asked Aria on um, the family devotions. And she asks, uh, whether, you know, if you could comment on what soul care for a married, married couple would look like, is it advisable um, for two for the two to do their quiet time together? And how do you advise a couple whose opinions differ on how to go about spending time with God? Um, since you're a pastor and maybe a, past, a pastoral counselor, maybe that. <laughs> uh, well, but, but I, would, I, yeah, that. I mean, I would say one size does not fit all. I have no mm -hmm. people who do their devotionals together, couples who do, and I know couples who do them apart. Um, I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to that. Um, I think both are valid ways of doing it. My wife and I have always done ours separately, but part of that was she was a school teacher, I was a pastor, and you know things were things were different in the schedules in the morning. Her schedule was different than mine, and so you know the idea of doing this together was just frankly quite difficult. And um, so we we have done our own thing and done it in our own ways. I think the important thing for couples is to be talking about your spiritual life together, to be talking about what, what God is teaching you, what you're learning, the questions, you know, the, the spiritual conversation, I think is actually the most important part of that. Whether or not you do your devotions together, I don't think is all that important. I think sharing the fruit of those devotions is important. Okay, um, so so during our our spiritual formation class, I think one of the things that uh, we did was the rule of life. Um, oh yes. <laughs> yeah. um, and I know there are many who would, uh, m most of us would not know what that is. Would you mind sharing a bit about what it is, but also what its benefits uh, for for many of us or for all of us might be. Yeah, so um, I had our students work through a book that was actually written by one of our colleagues at the seminary. It's called Crafting a Rule of Life. And uh, the author's name is Steve Machia. And Steve ran the Pierce Center uh, at Gordon Conwell. The idea behind it is uh, to step out of your life and to ask yourself, you know, if I were 75 or 80 years old, um, what would I want to look back on and how would I have wanted to have lived my life in an intentional way to serve 
uh, to glorify God and to serve his purposes in my life. So it's, it's a way of kind of um, getting out of your life, stepping back out of your life, and asking large frame questions about how you want your life to look after you've lived it. And then to go through a series of questions that would help you try to discern what you think God is calling you to do, what your mission in life is, what your purpose in life is, and then to look at um, how you will structure your life so that you can actually um, achieve those, those things, those things that you believe God is calling you to do. Are there some relationships? And how do you order your relationships in your life? How do you order your time? How do you order your your resources, your spending, your income? How do you do all that? Um, how do you relate to uh, the people who are your kids, your family, your spouse? How do you how do you deal with your body? Are you you know do you take care of your body? Uh, that becomes one of the issues and one of the parts of this as well. So there are a lot of things that you look at, but the idea is to come up with a document, and the book helps you kind of work toward the document. But a document then that is a working document, it's not fixed in stone, but it's a working document that when you in your in your wiser mind have said, this is how I'd like my life to be ordered, you actually have that put together on a piece of paper. So you can go back to it and say, oh, yeah, I'm not really, I'm not actually taking care of this relationship the way I said I wanted to. Maybe I need to recorrect or, or you know, um, adjust for that to recalibrate that piece of my life. So it becomes a, a kind of a guiding and shaping influence and document to actually help you achieve what you believe God is calling you to do and what you want your life to be all about. So um, it's called crafting a rule of life. And a rule here doesn't mean a rule as in these are rules, but it means uh, an order of life, crafting an order of life. Um, so anyway, yeah. So it, it deals with very kind of um, key issues in our lives and how we order our time and our priorities relative to those issues so that we can achieve the thing that we believe God is calling us to do. Does that give you enough, Joseph? Yeah, 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 yeah it does. Would um, I wonder if there might be some online resources just uh, for anyone who would want to yep. uh, uh, have a look at it? I have, uh, I have that book. Do you want me to pull it down and show it to you? I, yeah, sure, you could. <laughs> okay, hang on. Yeah, and see, uh, Lennox, you were asking about that. You were in the spirit, perhaps. Um, it's uh, by Steve Makia. I should be able to type that name in the chat as he looks for, for the book itself. Well, I know it's up here. I'm just trying to figure out where to put it. Yeah, uh, I, I will also be looking at uh, trying to post the link, uh, Amazon link, perhaps. Or oh, Manzi Kajina, you could... <laughs> Uh, help with that again. I, I don't see it on first blush. I know I have it. I actually, um, I actually took uh, a student, or not a student, but a, a guy here in town that I was discipling. Uh, I took him through that book because he said, you know, I want to, I want to really have a fulfilling life in Christ. I want to follow his his commands. I want to serve him. I just don't know exactly how to do it. And um, so I, I shared this model with him, and he's. He, uh, you know, I, I took him through the book basically and had him develop it. And it was very helpful for him, really helpful. So I'd encourage anybody who really feels like I'm, I'm just kind of fuzzy on what I'm trying to do with my life. This is a good tool to use to get some shape and to get some, uh, some focus on, you know, and it starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. So it's very important. I yeah. have my my dog is crying outside the door, so I'm going to let her in. Okay, that's fine. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know where I put that book. I had it out, but I must have set it down someplace. So anyway, that's um, very good. Yeah. So um, the the links uh, in the in the yes, Manzi, that's that's the one um, the one that you. You posted. Uh, so, in, in case you want to obtain yourself a copy, please uh, feel free to do so. It was quite quite helpful in uh, 
having an ordered, especially in the chaos and the much activity of life, there are some relationships and some things you may tend to neglect, not perhaps not intentionally, but also because you might uh, forget. Uh, and so just spending some time and crafting it and um, seeing how you could order your life can be helpful for uh, some of you. Um, there was a question by Joshua Omodo, and, and it's, it's something that you had touched on uh, already, but you could perhaps uh, respond yeah. to it again. He asks what advice or encouragement you would, would be uh, helpful when your, our spiritual disciplines feel completely dry. Is there something always wrong? And if not, how do we endure or go through those, those moments? Yeah, I think this is uh, it's a great question, Joshua. And I think it's something that everyone experiences. I, I think um, there's a whole literature kind of about spiritual deserts and what do we do when we feel dry or burned out or these kinds of things. And um, I think a couple of things um, might be helpful. Sometimes it's good to change up your routine a little bit. Uh, I'll give you just one example of that. So I have actually certain things that I pray about each day. So I read, I'm reading my Bible, I'm meditating on the text. Um, I'm praying around the day itself and what's coming and uh, asking God to help me uh, live the day well, uh, to hear his spirit through the day and so forth. Um, but then there are there are specific things, like today is Tuesday. So today is the day I pray for the health of people that I know who have health issues. So I focus on that uh, on Tuesdays. That's just part of part of the discipline. But on uh, Saturday, I don't uh, do the regular routine. In fact, well, I don't read the Bible on Saturday. What I usually do on Saturday is I enjoy nature and I let the creation um, refresh me and, and let God's revelation to it. And I pray out of my experience of the creation. I happen to live in a place right now that's very beautiful and it's very easy for me to do this because I have mountains that are snow covered. I have forests and I have the ocean all right here. So I just look out my window, but I let I let the, the revelation of God's creation, and I just thank God for the beauty of his creation, and that gets me thinking about a whole bunch of other things, and so it becomes a day of sort of natural theology thanksgiving, uh, if I can put it that way. Um, so it changes the pace a little bit of the week, um, and then that's that's kind of how I do it, so I'm not always feeling like I have to do everything the same each day, and of course, my my prayer list changes each week or um, each day in terms of what I pray. I always pray for my own family, but then uh, Mondays I pray actually for Gordon Conwell because I've been asked to do that. That's part of a prayer covenant that I'm in, so I do that. Tuesdays I pray for people's health that I know are struggling. Wednesdays I pray specifically for friends, uh, and on Thursdays I pray for uh, leadership, and uh, no, Thursdays I pray for uh, pastoral ministry, people I know that are in pastoral ministry, um, and or any kind of ministry, but full-time ministry. And then uh, Friday is leadership, and then Sunday morning I pray for people who are preaching the gospel and for people who are leading worship. So that's the way I structure my, my prayers during the week. Uh, but Saturday is kind of the day where I kind of get to go free form with just engaging with the creation and the beauty of it. And sometimes I'll even go out uh, get near the ocean um, or go somewhere where I can just be in nature and do it do it there um, rather than just sitting looking out the window, which is also good. But anyway, the point I would say is change it up a little bit if you're dry. Um, I would I would always say just keep going. Sometimes we get discouraged because we don't feel what we think we should feel. And um, it's okay. We all have those times, but I would say don't don't give up the discipline. Because even in the dryness, God will show you something and teach you something. So I would just say, don't, don't ever give up uh, in your devotional life. And if you miss a day, something happens, you know, and that always happens with people. That's just our lives are that messy. Some days you, you can hit it. Some days you can't. Don't beat yourself up. I mentioned that earlier. Um, I find it's a little bit harder for me when I'm traveling and staying with other people because my schedule I don't, I don't really get to carve out my time in the morning quite as well as I'd like to when I'm in someone else's home. 
and they say, well, let's get up and have breakfast earlier. Do you want to, you know, sometimes it just doesn't work out quite as well. So, um, but don't beat yourself up about that. Just, just maintain the standard. Uh, it's more the thing. Um, I try to, I try to go to the gym three times a week. I don't always get there, but I, I, I always try to go and it doesn't always feel good to work out. In fact, most of the time at my age, it doesn't feel good to work out. Uh, but I do it anyway, because it's in my best interest for my health. Um, and this is in the best interest of your soul. And there will be times when you don't, you know, maybe feel much is going on with God. That's okay. Just just keep reading and keep praying. And um, sometimes I find the use of a devotional book to be helpful in devotional readings. Joseph, when we did the course, we used the books uh, by, or the book by Job and Shachuk. Um and those are books that had a, a little devotional reading each day that went with the, the uh, biblical texts. And those readings were really good. I mean, there's some great Christian writers that they were using for those devotional readings, and they were wonderful. So um, and I think you know, all of those kinds of resources are available to you when you get dry or just feel kind of burned out. Um, utilize the resources that are there. I have certain authors that I find that just help me and give me life. And kind of, uh, I, I love to read them because they make me think and they make me remember who God is in a deeper way. So don't be afraid to use those those resources. There's tons of them available. And uh, if you need a bibliography, I can help you with that. So let me know. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so Sharon is asking about what you think about the concept of uh, sacred pathways. And it seems, uh, at least from what Mazi thinks is um, Gary Thomas's sacred pathways. What what would you think about uh, that? Well, you you may or may not remember that we use that book as one of our texts for the class, and so um, I, I like the idea of sacred pathways. I think he's identified some some things that are certainly true for me as I as I read through uh, and taught. We actually had lectures on this. I thought Joseph. I think. You were in the fall of 17. I, I can't remember. I think we did. I don't know if we had pathways then or not, but was, I think it was the spring of 2018. Was it? Okay. Okay. Anyway, um, the point is, I don't recall whether I was using that book when I taught the course for you guys or not. Yeah, you did. You, okay. You were. All right. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think for me, I certainly identified with a couple of the different pathways there. I'm an, an intellectual and a contemplative. And as I said, I like to use Saturday as my naturalist. Uh, there's a piece of me that loves loves worshiping God through meditating on the creation. And so that's the naturalist uh, pathway. And so I uh, engage that. But I wouldn't, I, I would look at it, um, don't, don't try and get too narrowed in. You know, um, I think there's probably a little bit of all of them in all of us. Uh, I, I around here, I like to use the analogy of golf, you know, don't play the whole course with one club, you know, um, use use the different tools that are available that help you uh, engage with God. So, uh, but I think Thomas's book is a very helpful book, and I have found it helpful, not only for myself, <clears throat> but also in the lives of other people. In fact, I'll tell you one story that just came to mind. Um, and this, I'm not speaking out of turn. Do you remember uh, Sharon Joseph? Um, Diwali? Uh, I, I don't know if I do. Anyway, Sharon said this in class one time that she had this aha moment from studying sacred pathways because she grew up in a, in a Pentecostal tradition that was very extroverted. And Sharon's an introverted kind of gal. And she was, you know, was very, very extroverted. And she always felt like, gee, I must not be worshiping God right because I'm not having all of these experiences everybody else is having. And she said when she read this book, she realized that she's a contemplative. And she said it was the most liberating thing she'd ever, because she thought she was just doing it wrong, you know, rather than recognizing, again, that one size doesn't fit all in the spiritual life. God's made us all differently. He, he approaches us differently. Um, and um, that's good. There's nothing, nothing at all wrong with that. In fact, there's Everything is right with that. You know, we would expect that because we're different and we're made differently psychologically and uh, that God would use different ways to approach us and different ways to attract us to himself. 
Yeah, and, and for some of you who may be wondering what um, some of those, you know, ways to connect God uh, with, he, you know, Gary Thomas mentions nine uh, of them. The naturalist, which uh, Dr. Tom was mentioning, just loving God outdoors. They are the senses, senses, those who love God with the senses. There are the traditionalists who love God through ritual and symbol. Some of you who love high liturgy, whether in the Anglican tradition or, or such. Uh, there are the aesthetics, loving God in solitude and simplicity. There are activists, those who love God through confrontation. Um, that's how he phrases it. There are caregivers, loving God by loving others. Uh, there are enthusiasts, loving God with mystery and celebration. There are contemplatives loving God through adoration. And then there are intellectuals loving God with the mind. Now, of course, uh, Dr. Tom mentioned the fact that, yeah, it's it's not like you are caged in in one. We tend to be a blend of more than one of those. And again, the book is available on uh, Kindle, uh, Amazon Kindle, if, in case you want to uh, take a look at it. Um, more questions are definitely invited. Um, and as they come through, just if, if you could talk to us about the bit of, I don't know if I would call it, uh, no, maybe more than accountability partners, but so care uh, group. I, I remember that was part of uh, the discipleship program at Gordon Conwell. Just, just having three or four people that with whom you meet regularly to uh, be vulnerable to one another and open and pray with one another and share about how your soul is. I remember that, I think that was one of the questions, how has been your soul uh, this week? And so I wonder if, one, if you could speak about the advantage and the benefits of that, and especially, uh, if, especially in the business of life, but also as we grow older, because I suspect, you know, pastors and ministry leaders might find it quite difficult to have that sort of accountability group, especially as, as you grow older, it becomes maybe harder. But what are the benefits of having such kind of um, care, so care group that you can be very open with, very trusting and very vulnerable to in terms of how you can care for your soul? Well, I think one of the great issues that all of us struggle with is the issue of shame in our lives. And we have parts of us that we're ashamed of, things that we do or have done that we're ashamed of. And we hide when we're ashamed. I mean, this is Adam and Eve in the garden. First thing they do is they hide because they're ashamed, they're ashamed right? So God calls to them and says, where are you? And I think one of the most beautiful things I've ever experienced in my life is to know people who know everything about me and still haven't run away. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I don't have anything else to tell them about who I am. They they know who I am. They know they know my sin. They know my depravity. They know my um, my dignity and my glory, and as well in the Lord. But to be to know. Um, to know and be known is, is maybe the deepest human need right there by to love and to be loved. And the, we're, we're just not going to reach those levels of intimacy with a large group or with necessarily a congregation on Sunday morning. There is good that comes from that, but it's a different kind of good. But I think really when we're talking about transformation, we need to be in a, in a, a small group. And it can be anywhere from two to six or seven people um, of people who will love us and care for us, who will listen to us, who will pray for us, who will encourage us. And you have to be able to trust those people um, with the darkness that is in all of our lives. And as we kind of share into that darkness and realize that they still love us, then that opens up the possibility for transformation because we don't have to spend our energy hiding. We can spend our energy thinking about what it means to be changed into the image of Christ, and we can be encouraged in that. So I think there's something really unique. Uh, the Irish Celtic tradition, they talk about the, uh, the Anamkara, which is translated from Gaelic soul friend, the soul friend, and everybody needs a soul friend I would say several soul friends. 
and I have a few I have a few people in my life. They're kind of spread all over the place um, at this stage of the game, but they are people who have become soul friends of mine over the years. Most of them I have known over thirty years now. Some of them, one of them, sixty years. Another one of them, fifty years. So the, these are people that I have traveled life with. Sometimes we've been close closer together, approximately. Other times, very spread out. But we've stayed in touch, and when something's going on, um, you know, immediately we we are in conversation around that and what will happen there. Um, I'll give you one example. One of those people in that group uh, got fired from his job, uh, and this was many years ago, and he was really shattered over this. Um, I I think it was quite an unjust situation, frankly. But anyway, another guy and, and I got together who were very good friends. We all we all went to university together. Uh, we've been friends that long. And uh, we just had a little sidebar conference and said we need to get him out here and we need to we need to love on him. So we bought him a plane ticket and we brought him out uh, out here actually to the northwest. And um, we just spent a week with him just trying to help him regain his footing because he had been really really shattered going through this experience. So that's where the benefits come into play. It's that that group of people that are going to be there no matter what through thick and thin, as they say, um, who will be there in support and love and care. And when that happens, that's transformative. When you get loved to that way, it's transformative. At least it has been for me. Um, no, thank you. That's, uh, I hope that's helpful for for all of us, um, again, so so one of the other things, and, and uh, you mentioned the aspect of um, pain and suffering that you encounter as a pastor uh, or as someone who is involved in ministry, and you could argue as well as someone who is, who is alive. And there is a sense in which, of course, for some pain and suffering draws them closer to God, but there are for others for which pain and suffering can create doubts. And so yeah. Yeah. how do you care for your soul in seasons of pain and suffering and doubt? Yeah, I think that's really, really important. Um, the first thing I think that I would say is that we have to be honest about our pain and our suffering. We can't pretend that somehow uh, we're not being spiritual because we're suffering or because we feel pain. Uh, it's I've just, I've, as I've mentioned, I've been working on this book. And one of the things I've been working through is the relationship between Job and Jesus. Um, and the more I have thought about this, the more interesting it has become and the more profound it's become for me, because I think that what we find with both Job and with Jesus is that their suffering drew them closer to the Father. Um, and so the, if you look at the dynamics of that, Job is mad at God. He's angry with God. And it's pretty, it's pretty scary. In fact, his friends basically condemn him for that. And they say, no, you're in trouble because you deserve to be in trouble. And look at your attitude. You know? um, and yet God, at the end of it, says, only Job has spoken rightly of me. So God, Job, if you will, is sort of in his anger, in his pain, in his suffering, has, if you will, taken God by the collar and pulled him near and said, look it, I'm hurting, I'm suffering. Why? What's going on here? And it's, it's fascinating to me that God not only allows Job to do that, but it's in the doing of that that Job finds his healing. Because what happens is God eventually doesn't answer all of Job's questions. What he does is he shows up in Job's life, and he says, only Job has spoken rightly of me. Um, and Job becomes healed through the process of the presence of God. In Jesus, we have Jesus dying on the cross, um, you know, and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Beginning of Psalm 22. But then the sense of into your hands, I commit my spirit. So this, this sense of Jesus even in his agony and suffering on the cross, he's still in relationship with God. In other words, the suffering brings him closer, brings him tighter. Um, he's asking questions, you know, why have you forsaken me? Where are you? 
but he also knows because he's read the whole of Psalm 22, how that Psalm ends and it ends as a Psalm of hope. So Jesus dies with questions and in hope. And I think most of us frankly live with questions and in hope. That's, that's the tension of our lives as believers. Um, so my own sense is that, that suffering is a very, very important part of how we develop our, our Christian lives and how we develop our faith. I mean, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was suffered horribly in the, uh, the, the Russian uh, concentration camps, suffered terribly, said that the prison taught him more about God than anything else he had ever experienced. And I think there's truth in that. Um, so rather than seeing suffering as something to be avoided, Jesus promises each of us a cross if we follow him. And there will be suffering in the Christian life. The question is, you know, he says, you know, you have to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Um, and so the question is, are we willing to enter into our, our suffering that is uh, to take up our cross? I'm not to take up Joseph's cross. Joseph isn't to take up my cross. We're to take up the one with our name on it, which is always the cross of Jesus too. So that's the thing. But it's, I, I think sometimes we we tend to think that if we're suffering, if something's hard in our lives, that we're doing something wrong spiritually. And um, that can be the case, but I don't think that's actually the norm. I think the norm is when we're following Jesus, it's going to be hard and we'll experience suffering. But one of the things we experience is his presence with us in the suffering, and that makes it bearable. Thank you so much. Um, that that is helpful. Um, I would I will have one probably one last question for you, unless uh, others another might you know sends in a question. But um, so part of what we try to do as a ministry is to root our uh, understanding of who God is, of course, and and salvation and all that, both in scripture but also in historical theology to see to be sure that actually we are believing what the church has always believed. Yeah. And so as we discuss issues of soul care and spiritual formation, would there be, um, you know, ancient figures or church leaders, whether it be church fathers or uh, in the medieval pe period or maybe the reformation and to the present, but uh, especially in the ancient people that you find were quite helpful in shaping your thinking about things that, you know, like uh, soul care and spiritual formation and spiritual disciplines that you, is someone that you think is quite crucial and maybe a work that we might want to read? Um, yeah, there, there are a number of people that have kind of shaped my own um, confidence and experience of this. Um, St. Augustine is certainly uh, one of the key figures from the early church fathers of the patristic period. He's uh, one of the key, key people. If you read Augustine's Confessions, uh, you'll see that this really is a book about spiritual formation <laughs> um, and how God formed him as he came to Christ and began to develop in Christ. It's a beautiful, beautiful book in that regard. Certainly worth reading. Um, in terms of others, oh gosh, um, I would say Thomas Kempis' Imitation of Christ is a classic. Uh, comes out of a, a a uh, thing called the Devotio Moderna, kind of a, a modern devotion, modern in the, I think, 15th century, 14th, 15th century. Um, but that's a that's a spiritual classic as well. I think one of the key writers in this in the 20th century was a guy named Thomas Merton. And Merton has been very important for my formation. I probably have eight or nine of his books sitting on the shelf behind me, and some of them I've read more than once. Um, and he's always been a person that has helped me really think deeply about who we are in Christ, what Christ has done for us, about the spiritual life, about prayer, uh, and about its meaning, and, and um, just the importance of prayer and Bible reading and so forth. Um, so th those are just a few. I mean, Francis de Sales' book uh, that he wrote back, uh, he's a contemporary of John Calvin's, and he wrote a book that was very important to me. I'm forgetting the title of it right now, but uh, it's a very, very fine book. And uh, there's a lot, there's there's actually a rich tradition. Um, there are women, some women have written beautiful stuff on the spiritual life. Um, 
you know, there's just a ton of ton of really good stuff that's out there. And um, through, and Joseph, I liked your point. I mean, through all the centuries, sometimes we get in our own little narrow thing in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, and we need to read outside of our own time because we realize the issues that other people struggled with actually may be more important than the ones we think are important. And getting out, out of our um, our own time frame is really helpful with that. But there are there are a bunch of people. There's actually a great book that um, James Houston, <laughs> who used to be the, the head of Regent College in, in Vancouver, did a book a few years ago. Uh, several years ago, I think, actually, just recently more, uh, called Sources of the Christian Self. And it's really a, a combing through, Joseph, of the tradition um, and looking at who are some of the, the influences who have helped us form our thinking about what a Christian is. And he's done a really nice job, he and a couple of other people, of combing through the whole uh, Christian tradition. Um, so anyway, there's there's a lot. There are actually some people in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Um, there's a two-volume work called the uh, uh, Philokalia, which is the, the the love of the beautiful, which talks about spiritual development. A lot of the monks, a lot of the monastic tradition stuff is also very good. Um, and Merton was a monk. So those guys think about these things 24-7, and that can be very helpful as well. But there's a very, very rich tradition of Christian spiritual literature and I, again, I just encourage uh, all of you who are looking for, for something to drink in, to feed your soul, to, um, to just dive into that, because there's, a, there's just a ton of stuff. Uh, Teresa de Avila is another, she's a Spanish mystic, wonderful figure in that. Um, just, there are just tons of people, tons of people. So. Yeah, no, thank you. I had thought, I had thought that... Uh... That was the last question, but uh, Claire dropped in the very, very last one. And she asks whether um, whether going for therapy or biblical counseling can also be a way to care for our souls. Yes, I think <clears throat> here's the thing. I, as I think about God, this this is how do you understand how God heals? OK, do I think that God let me, let me just use an example, a very personal example in my life right now, because as I told you just a month or so ago, my wife had surgery for breast cancer. Now, does the fact that we went to a surgeon mean that we don't believe in God? We don't trust God? No. What it means is if God wanted to heal her miraculously, he could have, and it would have been wonderful. If God wants to use another means for healing through the gifts that he's given to human beings, to study medicine and to study science and to become surgeons, if he chooses to use that as part of his common grace, wonderful. So what I think we don't want to do when it comes to these things is try and try and pit faith against knowledge. That's that's not the Christian formulation. Faith and knowledge work together, and they're all subsumed under the love of God and God's glory. So the gifts that God has given to humanity to help us heal diseases, to heal viruses, to heal all these things. This is part of God's love and God's, God's providence. The problem comes when there become people in the scientific community who decide that all of this comes from them rather than from God. That's a problem. Um, fortunately, I don't think most scientists believe that, at least the practicing ones in medicine that I've known. I think people of great faith, uh, but they don't see a problem with it, and I don't either. I think God is a God who has all kinds of opportunities and options through which to express his love. And science is one of them. And I don't have any problem with that at all. Amen. Amen. Um, I would definitely uh, love for you to pray for us uh, just shortly as we conclude, uh, but just grateful and thankful for those of you who have been able to set aside time and tune in. I am hopeful that this was an enriching conversation and I can see how some of you may be asking if this will be available uh, both to rewatch, but also to share with your friends and family and those that haven't been able to tune in or those of you who have joined us later. So yes, uh, this will be available uh, for you to rewatch. You can always join uh, or visit our WhatsApp, well not WhatsApp, our YouTube 
page, uh, just Veracity Found on YouTube, uh, should be able to, uh, uh, you should be able to access some of these conversations that we do have. But as I mentioned as well, we do have more activities that we do as a ministry. We do, we have um, monthly physical conversations in Wokoto behind Kenjoy Supermarket uh, every first Saturday of the month at 4.30 to 7.30. And this coming month, uh, which will be, I think, sixth, we'll be talking about the uh, reformation. But we do uh, invite you to visit us. You can, uh, you know, access our place and our ministry center every day, you know, Monday to Saturday, 9 to 5 p.m. Uh, again, we have a library. We do have small groups on Monday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, on Friday. On Monday and Friday, we have it in Wokoto, same place, 5.15 to 7.30. On Wednesday, we have it at Chukumi Chukumi Bethel Youth Hub, just opposite Helican Hostel. Uh, we are going through the book of John. That's 5.30 to 7.30. On Thursday, it's a ladies' community Bible study which takes place at Calvary Chapel, Kampala, 5.45 to 7.30. And those are some of the few activities that you can uh, join in. We would love to meet you uh, physically beyond this Zoom. But we have our next lamp posts. Uh, I think it should be 30th of next month, and we will be hosting Dr. Conrad Mbewe, where we'll be talking about the dangers of deliverance theology. Uh, I know most of you have been looking forward to that and you don't want to miss it. So uh, stay tuned. I will be sending um, a link, a uh, registration link for that. But in conclusion, uh, Dr. Tom, thankful, thankful and grateful for your time, for your wisdom, for your insights. Um, again, I, I enjoyed the time we had together and thank God for this sort of technology that enables us to, to have you close to us even when you are uh, across the ocean. Um, feel free, please, uh, to say, yes, we'll be with Dr. Uh, Conrad Mbewe. Some, uh, Lennox is asking, Conrad Mbewe, yes, we will be. Uh, <laughs> but uh, say, send, send our greetings uh, to Donna. We definitely, definitely uh, miss her. But if you don't mind, could you just say a concluding prayer for us uh, as we go to bed? Those of us, our day is first spent while your day is quite, quite uh you could say young could you could you say what prayer for us please sure our gracious and loving god we are so thankful that in your providence we have a technology that allows us to even do this even to sit here and share together and i thank you for joseph and daphne and their children and i thank you for the ministry that they're doing with veracity fountain i pray that you will bless it and um Lord, that you will prosper that ministry for your good and for your kingdom. Lord, I want to pray for each person who's on the call, that you will be with them. And whatever situation they're in, Lord, you know, I, I don't know, but you know. And I pray that you will give them encouragement, that you give them hope, that you will remind them of how much you love them, so much that you poured out your life on the cross for them. And Lord, let that reminder sink deeply into all of us that we are beloved children of God. And we rejoice in that. God, I pray that each person would be made fruitful as they abide in you and that you would encourage their hearts to set that above all else, that they would abide in you and therefore be able to bear much fruit. And so God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this time. We thank you for one another and for your kingdom, which comes in Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray in his name. Amen. 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 Um, thank you. And uh, I should be stopping the recording. If you want to stay around and just say hello, you're free to do so. But have a great day, uh, uh, Tom. And uh, a great night for those of you who are in Uganda and in East Africa. Gideon, it was uh, good to see you. Um, and good night for all of you. But you could stay and just chat. <laughs>